Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our brand new season of A View from Earth. We are so happy that you're joining us for, I guess this is season three now of our podcast, the official podcast of the Pisk Planetarium at CU Boulder in Colorado. And of course, with most things, we're still closed. Our theater is closed to the public. So we are still bringing you plenty of online programming like our podcast, which we hope is just going to continue forever, whether we're open or not. We're going to keep bringing you cool science stuff. Uh, my name is Tara. I'm a planetary scientist and a CU alum, also a presenter at FISC and outreach coordinator and all of that good stuff. And my co-host Colin is back. Hi, Colin. Hey, Tara. It's me, Colin. I uh, also present shows at the planetarium sometimes when the pandemic doesn't have the doors closed. Um, and I also like to learn about how space works at, as a student at CU. So that's what I do. Back, back to you, Tara. <laughs> Thanks, Colin. So we thought that we would kick off season three with a bit of a bang because we have a really amazing, awesome, wonderful, hilarious guest for you today. Not necessarily astronomy related, but uh, we're going to be talking about science and science communication and education and artutation and all sorts of awesome stuff with the amazing Miss Carrie Byron of Mythbusters fame. We're super excited to chat with her. It was so much fun. Um, she's going to be working or she has been working with Fisk on one of our full dome films that we're creating. Uh, she's narrating the film for us. So you'll be able to hear her in an upcoming Fisk movie once we have those showing again. But I personally had a great time chatting with her. She was hilarious and super sweet. Agreed. Yeah, yeah. She really, you can tell that she, you know, I think that there's kind of this uh, people that are very easy to talk to and are very uh, charismatic kind of end up in places, you know, like TV, which she does. And uh, that kind of showed, I think that she is just very, a very easy interview to do. Yeah. And I think it was really fun to talk to someone else who kind of like we do are doing sort of education and entertainment yeah. smushed together because mm -hmm. you don't see a ton of that really i mean it's because i guess it's become a lot more popular especially recently and then with you know tv shows and yep the youtubes and podcasts and all of that stuff it's like a thing now right right so i'm curious going back just a bit i don't really know much about the show that she's narrating with the planetarium do either of you know any like what it what the show is or when it's going to be released or if it was in the making before the pandemic struck? <laughs> so I don't think we know when we're gonna release it because we don't know when we're gonna be open again. Right. Um, I'm not sure what stage of production it is in right now. Maybe uh, the, the guy on the production team can help us out. John, do you have any ideas? Maybe the guy on the production team can, yeah. <laughs> so the show she's narrating is called Forward to the Moon. Mm -hmm. um, it talks about the Artemis pro program and our journey to get back, back to the moon. Um, it's, uh, it's looking to be premiered in the summer of 2021. Um, but as with all things pandemic related, um, that date could fluctuate. Um, but as of right now, we're looking to be on track to show that uh, in theaters and online both in a 360 uh, format as well as a VR uh, production uh, coming this summer. And is that something that would be distributed to other planetaria? Plan Ooh, listen to that plural planetarium. Yes. Planetar <laughs> or is that just a Fisk thing? Uh, that is going to be available to any and all planetarium, uh, planetaria uh, around the world. Um, like all our productions here at Fisk, we offer our shows for free to any everybody. Um, both. So if you're out there listening from yeah. another planetarium, hit us up. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Colorado.edu slash Fisk slash productions. You can see everything we've ever produced. Is there a standard, like, I want to say library, but a place where, you know, in-house produced full dome films 
intended to be used in other, uh, you know, I'll say also normally planetariums around the world, you know, cause there's some centralized bank of films that all planetariums just put their films or is it all just communication between buildings? So sort of, um, there's a website called Full, Full Dome Database um, that is not only a repository for uh, information on all the planetarium or many of the planetariums around the world, but it also serves as a forum for uh, planetariums to connect with each other. Mm. Um, and if you're interested in planetarium jobs as well, they have uh, job listings. Um, so that's, that's one of them. I think there are a couple other websites that do similar things. Is that how Carrie got in touch with Fisk is she was looking around and saying, man, I'd like to work with the planetarium and found I'm, that or <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how she, how she got, how she got involved in the project. Um, why didn't we ask her that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, part of me was wondering, and I guess, you know, one of you two could have stopped me. Part of me was wondering if that was still like on the DL, like if we were allowed to be talking it's about on our website. Film that we're doing with, oh, well, there you go. Yep. Maybe, <laughs> hmm. Well, it's always weird with like NDAs and things yeah, like yeah. that. You yeah, never know yeah. what to Yeah, what it's to very say. prominent on our website, so. Not very much a secret anymore. Not a secret. It'll be on my Instagram by the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> well, man. Uh, it's kind of cool though, the idea that she, you know, in, so we've done the interview, right? We're recording this little pre-interview conversation after the interview, which is kind of weird. But I think it's very interesting and kind of inspiring that she got on the show, right? By basically going and asking to be on the show, right? It wasn't some like, I mean, it was just her, you know, asking to do something that she wanted to do. And then, you know, that unfolded and here we are. That's what I always tell people too, when they're like, how did you get into research? I went and asked for a job. <laughs> I Done. said, Fran, will you hire me? And she said, no, but this guy will. Yeah, right, <laughs> so, exactly. Yep. You know, that's what I always tell little kids. Like, you wanna do something, ask. Mm -hmm. The worst they could say is no, and then you could ask somebody else and just right. keep asking until, that's how I'm approaching, you know, PhD applications too. I'm just mm -hmm. gonna keep asking until somebody says yes. One of the topics that we kind of, returned to a lot was this idea of, um, I don't know if globalization is the right word, but but a, a kind of a global mindset, right? And and kind of being aware of, of how things are happening around the world, right? And not just from where you're from. And I wonder if, you know, that, well, obviously it probably does, plays into uh, scientists and the life of a scientist is, you know, your worldly experience and, and working with people from all over the place and being elsewhere, you know, than, than where you grew up. Yeah. I mean, even on just my research team, we have a lady from Ukraine and her husband is there. He's from Germany. We have a girl from Dubai. I mean, there's, and that's just in our little like six people circle, you know, right. I mean, there's where I'm constantly, that's one of the things I love about it is I'm constantly working with people from all over the place and some of them have actually come here to Colorado sometimes I'm working you know with people at JPL who are from all over the place sometimes I'm actually getting on the phone with somebody who's in Ireland and it's like 9 30 at night for them but they're still letting me call them kind of right, things you know right. it's super fun I and mean, it's really cool yeah. well uh, I think that now is as good a time as any to jump into the interview and uh Here's some words from the one and only Carrie Byron. Sounds good. Let's do it. All right. And now we are speaking with Carrie Byron. Yes, of Mythbusters. Uh, for over a decade, Carrie has been a strong presence in the world of reality-based science and travel television. She broke into the industry as a host on Discovery Channel's Mythbusters as you know, uh, but has gone on to host and produce shows spanning several networks, Head Rush, Punkin' Chunkin', LDRS, Thrill Factor, Strange Trips, America Declassified, The White Rabbit Project, and Positive Energy. Her first book, Crash Test Girl, an unlikely experiment in using the scientific method to answer life's biggest questions is on shelves now. And her new series, Crash Test World, premiered on the Science Channel on January 8th. Carrie, thank you so much for being with us. Well, thanks for inviting me. 
So I guess a, a, a you know natural place to start is to ask about you know maybe if you could give us a, a quick backstory, right? What did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, what did you study in college, and how did that lead to you being on MythBusters and now doing the work that you're doing today? Well, I've always been a very arty person, and I've always loved doing 3D sculptural type art. I mean, even when I was little, I was sewing dolls out of recycled pantyhose, or my my front yard during Halloween was insane. So until I saw the making of Thriller, I didn't realize there was a place for such art. And I became obsessed with all the monster making and special effects. And of course, I live in the Bay Area near where they made Star Wars and all of, you know, the amazing things from that era. So I wanted to get into special effects. Um, and it was something that seemed very pie in the sky dreamy. But then when I went to college, since I don't have a major in special effects, I took sculpture, art, um, minored in political science, because, you know, I, I like to keep current anyway. Um, <laughs> so it, I kind of made my own major. And then after school ended, I kind of wasn't ready to enter the real world yet. So I uh, grabbed a couple tickets to different places and backpacked around the world for about a year with practically no money. And just, you know, sometimes we'd sell postcards if we ran out of money or do something arty or, but just mostly getting this incredible education on being a global citizen. Um, and then when I got back, I thought I'll try that special effects dream. Um, that's when I found Jamie Heineman and the M5 shop, which is where Mythbusters is, it, it was filmed. Um, and my first day after I begged to be an intern and work for free happened to be the first day they were filming Mythbusters. So I would clean up the shop. I would also be doing toy prototyping and the special effects that I was trying to get into. I wanted to learn from him. I do all this sculpting and kind of things behind the scene in the next room while they were filming, writing on a whiteboard or, you know, the beginning development of what became Mythbusters. So if you hear a cackling giggle in the background, I was the, that was me. <laughs> See, like that. So I was in the background of all the, the experiments until all of a sudden they realized about three weeks in, they weren't getting episodes done fast enough. So they asked me and Tori and a woman named Scotty Chapman, she was originally there, and Christine Chamberlain to be background builders. A couple weeks after that, they realized it's still not getting done fast enough. You're a host, you're a host, you're a host, come here. <laughs> and that's how I became a television host from a scrappy builder. Did they know right away about your your inclination for art and sculpting, or was that a, a lucky thing that you know that ended up being useful for what you were doing? Well, I mean, that's what I wanted to do for Jamie. Is like he mm. was he's incredible. He was known for like quick and dirty props, like and sure. for getting everybody their first job in the industry. And he just he's really smart and knows what he's doing. And I just wanted to learn from him. And I walked into his shop, and it was just magnificent you know the wood shop the metal shop the it was just everything that a maker could really want and it just it smelled of chemicals and just freshly cut wood so I was in I was super duper in it was like god light came down it was I wanted to be a part of it so uh I begged him for a job and told him I work for free and he's notoriously thrifty so that 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 applied and I went home and made a terrible portfolio that I watched him mercilessly flip through because you know he doesn't give away compliments very easily so he flipped through my portfolio got to the last page after no emotion and my heart sinking and slowly dying he goes maybe that could work <laughs> come back tomorrow basically but with less enthusiasm and what was that like this unenthusiastic invitation to come work with him on on the show i was so excited i was so nervous uh, i actually had a day job that i kept calling in sick for so i could go work for this unpaid internship and after a while they were just like okay so your picture was in the paper uh when we were doing the balloon experiment putting uh adam into the air with weather balloons on a lawn chair doing the larry the lawn chair experiment i was holding one of the ropes and happened to have had a picture taken of me they're like we know you're not sick can't get pink eye that many times so jig is up <laughs> i was okay so 
you come from this art background, but a lot of times people think of you as a science person. I'd probably because of the myth busting and there's a lot of physics and engineering and stuff going in the, you know, we see you with welders and things, people think science. And a lot of your work recently has focused on really encouraging, especially young women in STEAM and STEM. Is this sort of, has this been motivated by any experiences that you've had as a woman in sort of a sciencey background? It was a surprise to all of us that this was going to be a show that was being shown in classrooms. Um, I mean, of course, the scientific method is the perfect narrative vehicle for busting a myth. So it became very science. And I mean, the world is all science. So obviously, it's going to get associated there. But it wasn't what we had gone out to do. Nobody on the show is a scientist. Jamie has a degree in Russian. Adam has a high school diploma. Grant had a degree in engineering. So he was the closest. And Tori went to film school at, just as I did. So. For us, um, we are more citizen scientists at this point, but seeing what happened with the show and seeing teachers actually using it was really exciting for me because it made science different. It, it was it was a hands-on dirty science that I didn't really have in school. Um, it just it was just taught different. And seeing the excitement kids were getting for it, it really kind of it, it ignited for all of us what we could do with that platform. Um, I don't consider myself a science communicator. I consider myself a curiosity communicator because I've just applied critical thinking and curiosity to everything from the humanities to science. And I think that that's one thing that um, is most important for educating people now. It's uh, I definitely wanna get kids and girls into STEM and STEAM, but mostly I want a scientific competency and a familiarity with critical thinking. And did you, have you ever, I guess, it's something we talk about as like as scientists, women in STEM is always a huge thing. And it's always a topic that we want to talk about and address and all this. Is that something that you ever had to, that you ever ran into or came across when you're coming up, especially as someone who does sort of communication and science and art all together? Did you ever get any sort of I don't know, backlash or anything like oh, that. Oh yeah, it was definitely not easy. Um, I didn't get backlash for not being sciencey enough. Um, I got backlash just for being a woman host. Um, you know, I, I, I had little girls looking up to me and saying really beautiful things to me that made me want to fight more for that place. And I saw and met so many incredible scientists along the way that we used as experts that I was like, God, that's a great job. This is a great job for someone like me if I were coming back up again. And so I definitely wanted to encourage women to get into the field as well as I wanted to see more diversity everywhere we go. There was, I want to see more women. I want to see people of uh, economic diversity, of, of ethnic diversity. I, I love the idea that when we come together to solve a problem, if we come from many different places, it's more likely to get solved than if we're all the same view. So um, I think on Mythbusters, we all came from pretty different backgrounds, but could solve problems because we did it in such different ways. So uh, I guess that kind of brought my advocacy for diversity in STEM and STEAM. And have you seen like a change in attitude come about since then? I mean, that was 15 years ago or so when you started on Mythbusters. Definitely, there are so many more communicators and I feel like the internet has really made it easier. Um, it's still it's still something that like, I, I definitely see girls working a little bit harder to get to that place, but it's really highlighted some incredible people like uh, the physics girl. I, I love her so much and all that she's doing. Um, Diana, Courtney, you've probably seen her on one of your, if not, I'll give you her number. Um, <laughs> I love seeing people doing these beautiful things. Um, I had to fight to even be paid the same as my co-hosts back when I was working on my projects and ended up having to like get it in contracts that I would be paid the same as my male counterparts. So to see the evolution of people really changing the way that we do science and different faces doing it, um, is, it's just been beautiful. Raven the Science Maven, that's another one. I'm a big fan of hers right now. Yes, definitely. I gotta throw it out to all my women. <laughs> I like it. I'm a fan. Emily Colin Jolly, let's do her too. Let's do Emily. <laughs> Space gal. <laughs> yeah. Um, and if you don't mind me asking, now you have a daughter of your own. And has this made your 
advocacy for women even has this changed that aspect of your career or do you have any maybe like hopes as far as her growing up being a woman I mean this is a weird world right now I just you know I, I just hope she grows up to be happy um <laughs> I I think that um because I've had so much background with making science fun, I think our pandemic physics classes have been quite amazing. Um, we've, we've had a really good time doing experiments and I got to get a little feel of what it's like to be a creative teacher. And now that um, I'm doing a series called Crash Test World, our series shows on the Discovery Channel Friday, or, or sorry, Science Channel, um, every Friday at 12 and 12.30. But also our shows are broken up into smaller pieces and put on this uh, platform called projectexplore.org. Each one of those pieces comes with a lesson plan to make teachers' lives a little bit easier. So if you wanna learn about urban gardens or beekeeping in Detroit, you also have a lesson plan for a lower middle or high school class and some really high quality video content. So I've just, I, I, their jobs are just so hard. And I love that we can, give some quality content to teachers that maybe remote learning has been difficult. That's super what, amazing. Uh, was Project Explorer and, and maybe the, TV show, the TV show as a whole crash test world, did that come out of the pandemic? Were you searching for you know, way, resources to create for those that were you know, teaching and educating remotely? Or was this kind of born before the pandemic and then ended up being a really nifty resource for remote learning? Well, Project Explorer has been going since 9-11. They did YouTube before YouTube. Like it was always global citizenry that was kind of the uh, emphasis for them trying to show, you know, kids around the world what it was like to be outside of their space because the woman who created it grew up in New York. And to her, the idea that she could leave her town was something so foreign. So when she finally did, she, she wanted to bring that back to kids uh, where she lived. Um, since I also have this traveling sensibility and this just need for curiosity. Um, when I met her, we came up with Crash Test World. You know, it became this, you know, beautiful union of uh, my curiosity, her travel experience, and we want to do more of this, a lot more of edutainment just like this. So um, it, it wasn't something that came from pandemic, but it really got highlighted because of pandemic and it made us push harder and harder. We wanna do a lot more of it. We wanna do all sorts of shows together that um, go further than just what we're doing. I want science and home ec and sex ed and anything that you can help a school system out with, with highly produced video content because kids, they're on their phones, they're on their iPads, they're on their computers and you know the videos we saw back in school. They didn't necessarily engage you. I want high quality edutainment. So, you know, I think that you listed a couple of these very broad points, but, you know, considering this particular program, Crash Test World, uh, are there any uh, things that you're trying to particularly emphasize or issues that you're addressing, you know, in, in this uh, piece in particular? It's Crash Test World for me is a signal boost for the people who are the innovators and the change makers in the world, people who are bringing us hope, people who are, you know, looking to create peace in the Middle East or solve big questions like recycling or cleaning up the oceans, because there's so many people that are doing so much good that I want to find those people and try to find solutions to the big questions that face our planet. And uh, it also comes with a little bit of global empathy. I really, my goal right now is I want us to have a little more, this sounds so cheesy, but I want us to have a little more love. I want, I want a kid in Kansas to see a kid in Tokyo, to see a kid in Delhi and all of them look at each other and go, oh, that kid's just like me. You know, I, I just, I feel like with more cooperation, just like the diversity question with more of us working together, we can fix all the things that ail us. And it's so great that we're like in a time where that is possible. We could just hook up two kids from around the world. I think that's I know. great. <laughs> that's the positive of the internet. There's so many crazy things, but I mean, think about back when you were a kid and maybe you felt like the math nerd or there was nobody like you. Now you could find that kid all over the place and you can have your own core group of friends. It's, it's like sometimes it can be more isolating, but sometimes it can find you your people. Yeah, exactly. I love it. 
so we also wanted to ask you about your new book, Crash Test Girl, which I've read a little bit of. It's kind of like autobiography plus research notebooks kind of all meshed together. Um, and I liked how you really emphasized that science is universal and universally accept accessible and anybody can experiment and learn in, in pretty much all areas of life, right? So I also wanted to ask you, is this, did this come out of something particular? Was this like a position you had to defend at some point, especially maybe as someone who's sometimes an entertainer and sometimes thought of as a scientist, that sort of thing? I mean, more like I just really apply critical thinking to every decision I have to make. And I think Mythbusters trained me to do it in that way where it's like, okay, what's the question? Okay, let's do an experiment, gather some data. What's my conclusion? And I just started doing that with everything. And I, I realized I kind of apply that to everything from, you know, dating to, <laughs> to making a cake. It's just, it's, it's, it's the kind of thinking that brings me to better decision-making. So I wrote the book kind of, you know, Mythbusters had ended and people wanted to know more about it. And um, I, 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 it was a dare to write a book um, from uh, an author that I had thought it was a crazy idea and I never want to do that anything that vulnerable. But then my little daughter was talking about something that really scared her and I had to sit her down and give her one of those mom conversations where you're like, bravery isn't a superhero. It's being scared to death and doing it anyway. And I walked out of the room and was like, I got to write a book. I got to do this role model thing because nothing's scarier than writing a book and damn it. Now I got to do it. So um, yeah, I'll probably write another one someday when I actually can have more memoir because I'm still very young. So we really haven't defined what's going on here yet. Yeah, and I 100% agree with you. And I think Mythbusters helped train me do that too, <laughs> as funny as that is. Um, but something I think about, and I wonder if you ever worry about this too is that I think about yeah science should be accessible to everyone and everyone should be able to do science and experiment but I worry sometimes that this could contribute to this sort of rise in pseudoscience almost that we're mm -hmm. seeing especially a lot recently where people are claiming that their their science is just as good as this science and sometimes it's very much not but is that is that something that you've noticed or have do you ever think about maybe we need to take precautions with this sort of view? Crazy's always been crazy. It's always been there. People have always tried to like create gravity with a with you know a machine that, that works that you got from the back of a magazine. I just think we see more of it now. Um, that's why I've kind of shifted a little to critical thinking because I think that maybe when we get a little more evidence-based, we'll have a little less pseudoscience. I mean, we see it everywhere from the beauty industry with exploding candles to, you know, out there in politics, which uh, all you can do is combat the crazy with the truth. Um, <laughs> that's, that's all I got. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, Tara. I, I had a quick question. So, you know, a lot of this time, Carrie, you've kind of, it feels like you've kind of drawn this line between what we're calling science and then this other thing, critical thinking, right, and curiosity. I wonder, you know, if asked, and here you are being asked by me, what would you, what, what do you call science and do critical thinking and creativity exist? You know, are they, are they somehow separate in their own entity or are they, would you consider them all to be part of one uh, more central idea? Oh no, I, I, I just, I have not been trained as a scientist, but um, I think it's something everybody can do. And I don't draw a line between them. I don't think that, I think scientists make the best artists and vice versa. And musicians make the best mathematicians. Your brain just works like that. And I think when you add them together, when you get, you know, a counting machine that Ada Lovelace works on, all of a sudden you've got computer pictures. You know, I think that when there's a hand in hand with art and science, we actually get way more beautiful things. The critical thinking is just, so that we make less mistakes or learn from those mistakes. I think that a lot of people, you know, the view of science that many educators are kind of trying to reshape is that science is this, you know, sitting at a desk and, you know, you're, all it is, is is doing stuff on paper, or maybe it's, you know, the classic person in a lab coat with their goggles on. And, and I think that, at least in my experience, I feel there's a, 
kind of this motion towards science being much bigger than that, right? That science is the process of critical thinking and being curious and asking questions and thinking, well, how can I answer this question logically and, you know, and, and following the steps that you have followed, you know, and, and described so far on the show. Um, I don't really have a direction there. I guess I was just thinking out loud that I, I wonder if, you know, when you say, well, I'm not a scientist, I would feel like, I, you know, knowing you and what you've done, I would say, no, Carrie Byron is certainly a scientist. Maybe you, you know, don't publish white papers in the Astrophysical Journal, but I think that, you know, not I so wonder, far now. Not so far. That's, <laughs> that's, maybe that's part of the next book that you're working on, an excerpt. So. I'm a citizen scientist. I just don't want to take away from the mm. incredible research and actual education that people sure. who get their PhDs actually, I don't want to take away from that. Sure. I'm just sure. saying it's something I love. It's something that I hope my daughter gets into. It's something I want to promote. It's something I want to be a part of. I just, I, I have so much respect for the people that actually go through the academy uh, to get to that place. But I'm so glad they're there because when I don't know what's going on, I ask an expert. Those are my experts. That's what I'm, that's what I'm going to do. Perfect. Uh, okay, well, so I guess moving on and, and kind of talking about your global uh, experience, right? I mean, you've, you've been all over the world um, speaking on the role of STEAM programming on television in particular. And so I'm curious, and this, pro this answer probably exists elsewhere, but for right now, what is that role? What is the role of STEAM programming on television? Maybe what's, what's the role right now? And, and if it were up to you, what should it be? In an ideal world i mean i know that it's it's right now there are so many kids who are out of school and haven't been in school since the pandemic and it, this might be the only way to reach a lot of kids is through this sort of edutainment and trying to actually get smart programming onto television instead of you know just what what can be digested easily um and so this is the platform that i have so I, I i think it's important for us to make smart entertainment and i i feel like when i was traveling around there are definitely places you go that that's still very important um they haven't fully crumbled into reality television and we were sort of reality, but you know what I'm saying. Like we, we, there, there's, I, I think that there's definitely an important role as entertainers that we can help educate the world. I'd like to see more of that. Not that I'm traveling much, but I do, I do spend a lot of time on the internet talking to people. So I'm curious, you know, we were just talking about how you, you know, and, and your background has led to you thinking in a very scientific way and, and working to kind of produce uh, programming that is very uh, scientifically literate. And then we were also talking about, well, we have what we're calling, you know, the scientists, right? People, you know, maybe who hold PhDs and are, are you know, producing, you know, uh, white papers on their subjects and they're the true experts. I wonder if, you know, there's a way to kind of tie in um, people that are uh, more suited to entertain and kind of communicate with those that we often think of as being the scientists, right? I, I feel think like you're sometimes... looking for a job right now. Are you angling for a job? Like you want to host a show? I feel like that's what you're asking me here. Well, that's I what I'm, that's, yeah. So what I'm going to do is in 10 years, I'll have my PhD <laughs> and then I'm going to say, hey, now I have this, but also I want to, <laughs> no, no. Your motives are very clear. You're going to have to bring Tara with you though, because she got, she got the hair. So oh, absolutely. No, actually. <laughs> I, I was actually hoping that I could, you know, just kind of be assistant and, and let Tara take the reins. You know, she's already way further along and ready to go. So, no, no. Just so bring us your portfolio and we'll take a look. Yeah, right. We'll look, thanks. We'll thanks. Look. Yeah. You'll, yeah. You'll, well, you know what? There are some people out there uh, that I have been finding slowly on the internet because I do want to produce this kind of content myself and um, the next generation of awesome. And I have been finding so many great people that are the experts and are the scientists, but also have the entertainment value. And uh, I've been keeping track of them as I go. They're on TikTok, they're on Instagram, they're on YouTube. And there's a collection of incredible people who are interested in both. The extroverted biologist, yeah, find that one, put them on my list. Do you think that there's something about both paths that causes that person to be less common than either an entertainer or someone who goes and gets their PhD and does the science? Like, is there some reason that we don't see more, you know, 
uh, technically trained individuals wanting to communicate in a more entertainment sense? I, don't know. I've met, I mean, maybe it's just right my particular field, but like Maya Malik, she's, you know, she's an actress, but also she went to school for neuroscience and has incredible, she has an incredible mind. I mean, I, there's so many people I've met along the way that are multi-talented, multifaceted like that. Um, and even just working with different education uh, facilities around the the globe, when you walk in, there's always that one guy or that one girl that is all show and incredibly intelligent. So I, I, I don't know that there's a lack of them. I think that maybe just some people have a, a direction that they choose that is more academia and some want to get in front of this silly camera. I know the conferences that I go to every year, a lot of times they do have like a talent show night or like an open mic night for scientists to come and do things. And they're generally just I love them to death, but they're, they're so terrible. So we don't see a lot of that kind of crossover. I know both Colin and I kind of come from musical backgrounds and that's been a, a big part of it too. I've met a lot of musician mathematicians. I think that's the coolest crossover. So when I really wanted my daughter to get math understanding, I put her in guitar and it's, it, it's a strange pathway through the brain. I, I, I I, I mean, it could be a theory and it could be a long-term theory, but now she loves math and she can totally jam. Just saying. That's awesome. <laughs> These are my, th this, is, this is what you do as a mom. You experiment on your child. Naturally, naturally. Naturally. It, we had a nine-year practical joke where I told her, we were talking about this last night because I told her she was born with a tail since the time she was born, but we had to cut it off because we wanted her to be normal like the other kids. And to prove it, I said, ask anybody in the family, ask anybody that knows us if you have a tailbone. And everybody's like, of course you have a tailbone. This joke went on for nine years, right up until we were in a museum in France and this, you know, the custodian was talking about the tailbone on something and she had this look of horror and realization on her face like you've been lying to me my entire life she looks at me she goes the tailbone the tailbone <laughs> oh my god i was echoing through the loop just like dying dying nine year practical joke she's still mad she's still mad did you tell and her also, right then yeah. Oh, yeah. She the jig was up. She 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 was old enough not to be lied to anymore. I thought it was hilarious. I also had to tell her her cousin did not absorb his twin. But mm. you know, I came clean about all the things that day. I'm a terrible mom. <laughs> how how did that practical joke come to be? Like when at what point did you think, hmm, this is I'm gonna do this? I you know it just evolved. I have a sick sense of humor, and this has just <laughs> been something that I didn't have Tori anymore to mess with, so I had to make a friend and. Uh, there you go. Well, it She's sounds like you were the successful. recipient of it. They're not that smart when they're little. Like you can totally tell them stuff and they believe you. Wait, so now I'm curious. Did Sorry, you I took you on to... a real tangent there. No, you know what? That's a... <laughs> this is dangerous, Carrie, because now I'm thinking about this and I'm wondering like, did she ever talk with friends of hers that also, you know, like asking, hey, did you, did you ever have a tale? Did your parents ever talk about some tale that you had? And I mean, then, maybe it was just too embarrassing. Like mm -hmm. you a kid that was born with a tail. That's right, uh, right. That's very inclusive. That's a great point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I guess back to the subject matter of the show. Um, <laughs> so, so you know, you are seem to be very. Uh, you have a really good understanding about how we can use uh, uh, programming on television and entertainment. You know, to to kind of point towards steam. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about. Uh, what we do at the planetarium, right? We're a science center um, and we produce shows. In fact, that's part of the reason that we are talking with you right now is that you've recently worked with Fisk on the production of a whole dome film. I love planetariums. So cool. So I'm curious, you know, with your familiarity with them and, and with the whole field, I wonder if you have any thoughts about how a planetarium or science center can help to advocate the role of STEAM in the entertainment industry. I mean, I think just doing the shows that you do does that because I walk in with such wonder and I'm, you know, since the time I was a kid, planetariums and the shows that you see in the, the science museum are so exciting. Uh, the local science museum here, I would take my kid to all the time. We went through the earthquake exhibit probably 40 times. She want, had it memorized when we walk into the dome to talk about it because it was just so freaking fascinating. And so, I mean, right there, you see all the sparkle in her and 
I get the same excitement when I walk into a planetarium. I love just leaning back and being immersed in that, especially, I mean, especially when the stars start moving above you. Like it's, I think, I think you're, you don't need any advice from me. You're doing it. It's fantastic. I saw the show that you put together. I'm, I'm excited. I want to go to Colorado someday when I'm allowed to fly on airplanes. Well, thanks. That's very kind of you. It feels great to know that, uh, you know, we're, we're doing the right things here at the planetarium and uh, planetariums around the world. Yeah. I can't imagine anything engaging more than jumping into a planetarium as a kid. It's just so cool. I think everyone remembers their first planetarium experience. It's yeah. just one of those things that you can't forget. I was actually, there was a, a while ago, I was doing something for a cruise ship and they had a blow up planetarium that they put in where you lay on the floor. And, you know, it's funny cause you know, you can actually go up on deck and see the actual stars, but the little planetarium in their theater, I was like, God, I still love this. This is so cool. This they used to have- Free pandemic. Right, <laughs> naturally, yeah, yeah. Uh, they used to have uh, blow up planetarium days at my elementary school library. And I remember everyone, oh. that was just like everyone's yes. favorite day. We knew when it was gonna happen, you know, and it was like better than any field trip. It was to go straight to the library and sit in the planetarium and listen to someone talk about space. Great idea. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty awesome. Yeah, we have one here at FIST that we take to elementary schools and libraries and YMCAs and stuff. And oh my God, it's it's hilarious because it's sort of challenging for like me to do my job because these kids are just so excited. Wow. Like they don't care what I have to say. They just want to <laughs> look at stuff. They want to see pretty pictures. Let's look at the moon, all sorts of stuff. They're hilarious. I as long as you spark that, they'll take it to the next level. Then they're going to go home and ask the questions. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, they like to hug you on the way out. And I'm always a big fan of that. <laughs> So another thing we always like to ask some of our guests that come on, is there anything we haven't asked you about that you would love to tell us about or to talk about or any particular questions that you like to answer? Hmm. Can I ask you a question? Of course. What has been a hobby that you've come up with or a skill during pandemic -y lockdown times that you did not have before just for fun because boredom creates the best stuff? <laughs> Have you done anything or learned anything? I have not. I wouldn't say a hobby. Um, doing a lot of this online programming through the Planetarium has been a big change. I'm used to, you know, being in the theater and talking directly to people and not talking at a computer or a camera. But now we're doing like the podcast like this. We have um, like a weekly program that we do for schools that we give to teachers for free and stuff on YouTube. And uh, doing a lot of that and learning how to work with technology and remote audiences and it's it's a whole other ball game that you know talking to a camera instead of talking to an audience that's been a huge change but it's been really fun and I'm glad that I have both of those skill sets now that I can utilize both of those I think that's been probably the coolest thing that I've done I've also just I been mean that pushes along. out your outreach because you can do this for kids in you know Russia or China now that's so great yeah, exactly. I've gotten to do little like science talks with, you know, I have friends that are teachers in the middle of nowhere, West Texas, and I get to go in and be like, I'm an astronomer. Let me talk to your seventh graders. And they just get so stoked because they don't have opportunities like that. So I love being able to, pr you know, provide this kind of material and content and education for kids that don't normally get it. We should talk later. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> what about you, Colin? Well, I'm very fortunate to uh, work with a uh, youth e the educational theater group uh, on the summers, you know, between school years. And uh, I do, I music direct the shows, uh, the camps that we do. And so because of that role, I am in charge of housing the uh, company's electronic drum kit um, in between Ooh. when we use them for shows. And so I thought, well, man, they're just upstairs in my closet collecting dust. So uh, I might as well learn how to play the drums. I, it's not something I've ever done before, but it's one of my favorite things. And so I have brought my drum kit up here. Oh, yeah. V drums up here to my apartment in Boulder and have been learning how to play the drums. So uh, that's something new that I've been, that I've been doing uh, in addition to, like Tara said, you know, trying to get used to online programming and, and doing things like that. That is fantastic. I love that. Hopefully, you know, my my primary instrument is the piano and I have really bad sense of rhythm and time. I like to just go too fast or sometimes too slow and it's never very consistent. So hopefully the drumming, you know. Get you one of those metronomes. Right, right, exactly, exactly. 
Those things make me sleepy. I really like them. British people telling stories and then the metronome. Those things make me go right to bed. British people telling stories are the best though. I don't know what it is about their voices, but I will turn on the wind reports. I will just you know, listen to, you know, or, or someone like Neil Gaiman when he reads his stories. So good. I love that. Um, if you ever drive late at night and turn on NPR, they play BBC World Service. Yes. Um, which I guess for you might not be a good idea if that's going to make you sleepy while, while you're driving. driving. Right, right. True, true. I hear we'll keep dangerous. NPR for the day. That's right. Smart, smart. Yeah. Smart. <laughs> I personally have learned to bake a killer sourdough bread. I've spent a lot of time indoors because my kid's in school, so we have to stay home for remote learning for a lot of it. Um, my hula hooping skills have definitely increased because uh, you got to get exercise. <laughs> I'm learning to crab fish. Yeah. Like on a boat, like actual, no, like- just you walk out into the tides oh. wearing like the rubber pants, the, the waders, and you have a little cage with snares on it and you just cast out and I'm, I'm learning to uh, crab fish. I'm, I'm gaining the weirdest skills. I also am getting better at knife throwing because I had a lot of Amazon boxes and they turned into a target. <laughs> you could combine that with the crab fishing and- Right, cut up the crab. Put it in the sourdough bowl. So San Francisco. There you oh, go. God. Right? <laughs> so I just, I love hearing what people are learning and doing when they have this extra time, because I'm personally somebody who's always on the road, always doing so much. So getting locked here was insane for me at first. And I was just, I was setting up like nerf target ranges for my kid. And um, I made her do ninja training where I basically was just throwing water balloons off the second floor at her and making her dodge them, but within a small area, just coming up with weird things to entertain us. And, you know, slowly we've gotten used to this, but at first it was madness. I'm curious uh, when, so I'm sorry, this is going back a little bit. I, I do not, I'm not very much a baker and I have never made sourdough bread but I'm under the impression that sourdough bread, part of the way that it works is that you have dough from previous dough in sourdough. How did, did you have to acquire some sort of, you know, uh, base a starter, sourdough? Starter. A starter. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yes, well, he, when my, when I was growing up, my dad always had a sourdough starter in this really old porcelain -y jar that, you know, he said was hundreds of years old. It's my dad, who knows? But it, it looked very old, but in the 89 quake, it broke. And so this, this dough that had come from, you know, family generation to generation is gone. So I, I always wanted to get back to that. And a friend of mine had a sourdough starter and she gave me a little bit of it because you've got to feed it every day like it's an animal. You watch it. If you're gonna go away for the week, you put it in the fridge and come back and you have to feed it so it comes back to its right starterness. And, it, you know, I've slowly broken it off for other people but there's a whole culture around it people that do this because you don't need yeast. All you need is water and bre the uh, bread flour and salt and that's it. And all the flavors come from the environment around you. So a sourdough in San Francisco at the beach tastes different than a sourdough in Oakland out in the city. Like we have different cultures in the air that are gonna make it taste different. So I have the bread in my house will only taste like the bread in my house, which is delicious. Um, and another uh, skill that you need to learn is you have to have a really good sourdough starter name. Otherwise your bread isn't very good. So mine was birthed from a sourdough starter named uh, Clint Yeastwood. Uh, I had first started out with uh, bread shearing, but the flavor wasn't coming. So um, I broke that off and started a new one. So now I have Evil Bread 2 and that one is really kicking because you know, you got to go to the horror movies. The other one was a little, just a little too white bread. A little bland. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was awesome, it, but it, it didn't get till I got to evil bread. And I've got a friend who I broke some off and she's really into books. So she's got Finnegan's Bake. Um, uh, <laughs> Bready Van Halen's another friend. Just, this is what you got to do. This is, this is the, the, the nerdiness of the sourdough culture. It's very San Francisco. Culture. I just, I just, that's science. That's a hundred percent science right there. So science. <laughs> Are all sourdough starters named after a recognizable uh, figure or, or piece of art or are there, can they simply be, you know, like Ed? I mean, yeah, but you know, of course, but it's so much fun to come up with a real good pun. I mean, that's kind of my thing or puns. I, 
Yeah. yeah. So if you can I, put I a pun like, in there, like do you it. Just name it Ed. It's fine. Here's my starter, Betty. It's fine. Right. But if you want it to perform, you gotta mm. love it. You gotta, mm. you gotta. Well said. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that exhausted the list of questions that we have, but we still have some more time. We didn't want to take up your whole afternoon or anything, but uh, Colin, John, was there anything else that you had that you wanted to jump in with? Well, that was my very last <laughs> question that I had typed up. And I wanted to ask, what was your favorite episode of Mythbusters to film? I mean, usually we were in places that were kind of hot and dirty and dusty. So when we got to film Shark Week, when we ended our days, we were in the Bahamas. So I really liked Shark Week a lot. It was, it was exciting for us to all get out together. And it was like going on a family vacation because these are the people that you spend all your time with. And we all got on a plane together and we all got to stay in a hotel together. And then we do these crazy experiments with sharks, which are completely unpredictable. And they were there. The mythology associated with sharks is so cool. And we could actually build things and we had to be more scrappy because we were on the road and we couldn't bring our tools and everything with us. I mean, to a point. So it was, it was really fun to do those. I really liked the excitement of finding out if, sharks were attracted to flashlights and doing an underwater shoot in shark infested waters at night and they are and it was scary and that have way better stories now because of it they're very scary at night they come out of nowhere did you were you ever at a point where you were like really like concerned about you and your team's well-being you know being in such close proximity to these you know potentially very dangerous animals or did you were you confident that you know, your equipment would keep you safe and the animals safe. We got pulled out of the water at least once because a tiger shark came and they're like, that chain mail you're wearing isn't going to do nothing. You got to get on the boat now. So occasionally, and then there was at one point where the shark grabbed onto Grant's arm with its mouth and then used leverage off of his arm to knock my goggles off my face. So the last thing I saw was a shark biting Grant and it's sliding off the chain mail, right? But then his tail goes and I'm blind and can't breathe. And I'm just like doing all the procedures to get my mask back on. Just like, ah, what am I gonna see? Okay, I'm gonna live. <laughs> yeah, but I was more, it was more dangerous actually just being in the shop when we're running around and you know, sharks are an obvious scary thing. What's not as obvious is the bandsaw, you know, like that's a dangerous thing if you move too quickly. Would you call, uh, you know, that the Shark Week the the scared, scared most scared you have been on set, uh, or were there other times when you were like, oh man, this is not what we expected to happen, and then it did? Um, it was not the most scared. I think the most scared is early on, we uh, tried to do, emulate that balloon experiment with Mr. Bean where he gets a bunch of little party balloons and we got a four-year-old uh, buoyant with, I think it was like 36, it was, was it 3,600 balloons? I think it was, it was a huge mass of balloons and we got our buoyant and to get all these balloons out of this hangar, um, we were popping them to get them down so we could go and our, soon to be fired safety officer thought it would be really cool to shoot the balloons with um, this, this BB gun that he had. So the neighbors, nobody knows what Mythbusters really is at this point, called the, the cops and the security and they're like, somebody's shooting guns over at the Air Force base. So they rolled up just armed and yelling, screaming, get on the floor. And all of us were like, whoa. And at the same time, our safety officer who, oh boy, he started walking at them with his gun in the air saying, it's all right, it's not real. And they're like, put that gun down. And there was a screaming match and we were all confused. And there was a crying four-year-old and I'm face down in the dirt, just like, oh my God, we're gonna die for this stupid show. <laughs> that was very early on, yeah. So that was way more scary than sharks because I feel like I can get away from a shark. <laughs> I can't get away from bad decisions. Well, but see, I feel like, you know, that's, you know, you and your team, other than the safety officer, you're just like trying to do science, you know? They so. don't know that. We're so, we are, I, I had these giant claws on that were mm. knives so I could break balloons. Like, yeah. I have, a, and it's attached to me. My weapon right. doesn't even come off at this right. point. Right, yeah. Like, stuff like that. We did a lot of weird stuff. Mm. Yeah, yeah, not the best look to people who think you're trying to like break into the Air Force base. 
I mean, That's we one true. time had a, a gap. No, it's that this was a, a grappling hook air can explode in the shop and blow up both ways and almost take us out. We had so many instances where we're just like, oh, that could have killed us, but it didn't. So yeah, shark schmarks. We had chain mail. Easy. No problem. Totally fine. <laughs> Did you have a favorite build that you did on there? I know you said you do a lot of sculpture and, and art stuff anyways. Was there anything that you that you constructed that you were very proud of? I mean, I just, I liked the build where we all got together and um, communally did something because it was it was more exciting in the end. I'm just, I'm really into the community of the build because um, we'd go off and do these competi competition things separately. And then, you know, we'd start getting mad at each other, competitive. I liked it when we made, we took our whole shop and made this MacGyver ultralight, which is like, a, it's like a plane, but it was made out of like, a, it, it, it had a, a engine from a lawnmower and it, it was made out of bamboo and duct tape and it was huge. And we had worked on it so hard for so long that I just, I think that we, we maybe we were just tired. We really believed it would work in the end. Like everybody filming us were like, yeah, that's not going to work. But me, Grant, and Tori, by the end, were like, no, we did this right. We tested everything. And I remember standing at the edge of the cliff with this giant ultralight, just all the duct tape and everything. And Grant looked at me, he's like, okay, okay, so um, I'm going to remote control this and, and I'll fly it around. And if it stays up, then we're going to fly it around and land it right back here. And me and Tori are like, yeah, yeah, well, we're going to do that. <laughs> it went right off the cliff, fell straight down. And we're like, why do we think that was going to work? But we loved, we had so much love in that build that I think we thought we could make it fly with just pure willpower. I've had some experiments that went kind of like that too. <laughs> I mean, we've got some really great builds. We built some stuff that we took to NASA where, you know, they were impressed with us and that always felt kind of good. Like, oh, this would have taken us longer because we have to actually go through procedures. You guys can just slap it together. <laughs> so, it's, it, you know, we've, we've, we've had a lot of fun. I, I miss those guys. Do you still get the opportunity to do lots of building and, you know, handiwork these days? Not as much as I'd like to. I mean, I've got a pretty sick DeWalt set in my garage and um, I mostly like fix things in my house because I'm a homeowner and then there's always something to fix. But there's just not any need to do big, crazy, crazy builds. So uh, hopefully sometime in the future, maybe another show will show up where they like building things. That would be awesome. Do you have any projects on the mind that you'd love to uh, try out at some point in the future? I mean, as far as something to build or a show? Yeah, sorry, that was kind of unclear. Is a, a build, do you, have any, do you have any ideas, you know, that you have yet to build, but you'd really like to someday. I mean, I'm obsessed with those wind walkers that you see that are all kinetic sculptures that walk on the beaches. Have you seen those? I don't know. It's, I think it's very, so. Yeah. They're just, I, I would, I like kinetic art. So for me, that would always be fun. Um, I, I personally don't have a lot of space for building big things, but I mm. do black powder paintings in my backyard with um, residual black powder that I got from the show and uh, from my friends at the, uh, never mind from that I just collect myself. Right, um, right. <laughs> yeah, I had, I, I like to do a lot of art with that kind of stuff. And I guess I'll, I'll piggyback off of my, that unclearness of the question. Do you have other projects that are not building related that you are kind of have on the mind that you're looking forward to? Tori and I are a crazy team of constantly pitching weird and wild ideas. So, um, some of them are getting some steam that I can't talk about, but we'll see, we'll see. But in the meantime, I'm all about Crash Test World and just, you know, Tori's got a show, I've got a show. Someday, hopefully we'll be working together again. But um, I stay pretty busy trying to get us on the road again. Once I get that vaccine, no stopping. I don't think I'm really high on the list. <laughs> I'm healthy, I'm, I'm not at risk for anything. So, you know, more of this. It'll It'll happen. It'll come. It'll happen. Well, that is about all the time that we have. So thank you again so much, Carrie, for joining us. It was a blast talking to you. And yes, again, everybody check out her new book, her new show, Crash Test Girl and Crash Test World. Super excited for both of those. Thank you again so much. It was great chatting with you. 
It was awesome chatting with you guys. Hopefully I can do it again someday for sure. All right, and that wraps up our interview with Carrie Byron herself. Uh, we'd like to thank her one more time for giving us uh, the time out of her afternoon to chat with us about all of her projects going on right now um, and about her time on the show, Mythbusters. We cannot uh, say thanks enough. And we'd like to remind everyone to check back in next week for our talk with Dr. James Mason, uh, who specializes in CubeSat engineering and fabrication. For those of you that don't know, CubeSats are, uh, short for Cube Satellite, are um, small satellites, right, that will do science for us. So basically, we're going to talk with somebody, we are going to talk with somebody who knows how to engineer and create actual satellites uh, for the use of science. So that's pretty cool. And that's happening next week. You can find more details on our website, colorado.edu forward slash FISC. Um, from there, you can also uh, subscribe to our podcast, or if you're feeling extra generous, you can donate. Uh, we rely on donations from people like you uh, to keep going, and we really appreciate it. Um, finally, this podcast is on YouTube, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. And we'd like to thank you, the listener, for listening. We'll see you next week.